Hello, welcome back to this class where we are discussing about the corresponding thermal degradation of a very simple salt what we know and what we use from our school days which is your copper sulphate pentahydrate and we want to see the corresponding plot that means Tg plot we want to see. So, if we know nicely this particular Tg plot and if we can analyze this thing very <laughs> correctly you should be able to a mass loss characteristics like this what we have seen most of the time we draw like this and is a very simple one as we have seen in case of and we have analyzed that for also your calcium oxalate and your magnesium oxalate sample. So, what we have seen that we have the different steps and these steps are for the corresponding elimination of the different uh, number of your water molecules. So, if we have this particular copper sulphate pentahydrate, so what we find that we have step number 1, step number 2, step number 3, step number 4 and step number 5. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, what is the corresponding step? So, if your sample is very pure and if we go for the corresponding elimination in this fashion that means when your temperature is just above 100. So, it is just above 100. So, you have this corresponding 120 then 40 then 60 80 and 120 degree centigrade. So, when we have this particular one that means when you have just 100 degree or 120 degree centigrade we get the corresponding first weight loss. And so, we have the corresponding weight losses and these weight losses are such that we can have two equal steps that means you have this that means you have in this particular first step is, uh, is that that you have initially you just go for loss of two water molecules. So, first step will corresponds to the two water molecules. So, what we should know now for this particular information that in a stepwise manner your all the six things that means you have five water molecules as we have seen that you have five, but all these five water molecules are not same. That means their entrapment within the crystal lattice is different. So, their connectivity within the solid lattice is different. So, that is why all five are not going away immediately at a particular temperature and also it is not of your typical lattice water what we know that the dehydrated sample because what you expect that if we go like this like your calcium oxalate or magnesium oxalate that means if we go for as typical anhydrous copper sulphate. So, at some point we should get so if all five water molecules are eliminated in a single step we should go for the corresponding one as your copper sulphate pentahydrate species, but the first step we have the corresponding loss of two water molecules. So, what we get at that particular point and if there is a good baseline, but we do not have that baseline good baseline that means the stability of that particular step is very less that means the stability of the corresponding species what is formed over there what is that which is nothing but after removal of your two water molecules we remain with only copper sulphate trihydrate. So, this copper sulphate trihydrate has not much stability. So, it immediately go for its loss again for another two water molecules. So, these two are almost consecutive, but at two different temperatures. So, this is being completed. So, it is starting from say around in the uh, so it is starting basically the loss is starting around 80 degree centigrade and it is basically complete at 120 or 140 degree centigrade where four of the water molecules are going away and those loss of four water molecules will also correspond to a loss of minus 14.3796 percent and minus 14.2034 percent. So, is a 14 percentages of loss in these two steps will correspond to this particular that means by weight it is 4.5296 and 4.4741 milligram. 
So, these two are we are losing, then what we get we have the corresponding one for your course uh, loss that means, the next step the next step will definitely be your corresponding percentage in terms of half of the 10. So, if first one is 14 percent, second one is 14 percent, the third one will be 7 percent. So, you have in the first step the 14 percent weight loss, then the another 14 percent weight loss. So, what we get at this step is the monohydrate copper sulphate monohydrate, then you have the anhydrous copper sulphate. So, at this point when you reach here, we get the corresponding anhydrous copper sulphate. And this anhydrous copper sulphate, what we get basically above 250 degree centigrade. So, if we want to make a sample of copper sulphate which is anhydrous and hydras in nature because it is uh, blue in color this particular in the solid state also, but anhydrous thing of this copper sulphate is colorless. So, which we get around 250 degree centigrade. So, at 250 degree centigrade what we get as the colorless copper sulphate which can be considered as the anhydrous one. So, if we take this anhydrous copper sulphate and keep in again in, in some moist environment or in moisture containing some environment of air, it will again trap those water molecules and it will again go back to your pentahydrate sample. So, what we see now the stability of this copper sulphate that means anhydrous copper sulphate which is not so easy to get because in most other cases like your anhydrous calcium oxalate or anhydrous magnesium oxalate most of the time we get that around 140 or 150 degree centigrade we get the anhydrous one. But here we have to reach around 180 degree to lose 4 water molecules and to get typically anhydrous one which is above 260 degree centigrade. So, only above 260 degree centigrade we get the corresponding anhydrous copper sulphate sample. And this anhydrous copper sulphate sample is pretty stable from this temperature to say about 600 degree centigrade. So, till 600 degree centigrade we do not see any loss of mass from the copper sulphate sample. But when we heat the sample at 600 degree centigrade we see a, a little bit of uh, monotonous weight decrease from here and which is little bit broad also and we go up to say 780 degree centigrade. So, this is your 780 degree centigrade. So, till 780 degree centigrade we have some reasonable weight mass loss which is corresponding to 32 percent of the weight what has been taken and in terms of milligram it is 10 point some amount 10.1187 milligram of weight loss almost one third of the sample what we have taken for the measurement. So, this particular one if we correlate nicely with that of our sample and we have seen that we have SO4 2 minus as the anion, but when we go for the solid state heating. So, the solid state heating of this sample of this copper sulphate pentahydrate basically giving us the loss of SO3. Now, SO3 will be losing from here as we have seen in one of our previous example of your ferrous sulphate heating that SO3 is the most useful component what we get that means sulfur dioxide elimination from all sulphate samples are very easy particularly at a very high temperature which is above 600 degree centigrade. So, if we get that means this is the case of loss of this SO3 then once we get SO3 loss from the your copper sulphate we immediately think of that okay, this SO3 is going out from one copper. So, we must have copper oxide over there. So, end product can be your simple copper oxide in your hand, but is not like that. So, what is your end product for this particular type of thermal degradation? So, whether cupric oxide will be your end product or not. So, we keep on heating the sample from your this 6, 8, 780 degree centigrade because it started from 580 to 680 to span basically over 200 degree centigrade. So, throughout this 200 degree temperature rise your SO3 elimination is complete. 
So, if we go beyond that temperature, so around 900 that means around 7, 8, 80 degrees centigrade, there is a very small weight loss which is roughly about 3 percent. So, 3 percent weight loss and the amount is also only 1 milligram in the range and then the amount which is remaining over there at 1000 degree centigrade, we can correlate that that what is the remaining sample by looking at the weight left on the pan what is they have taken for the heating. So, the weight of that particular thing that means the empty pan weight and the residue of the sample what is formed over there by this particular heating process will tell us the residue weight is 9.0235 milligram corresponding to a percentage of around 28 percent. So, that 28 percent weight remaining as residue on the crucible is not due to your CuO, but is due to your Cu2O that means is during this particular heating process the sample has an inherent tendency to give you the corresponding form as the cuprous oxide and this Cu2O basically going for itself uh, reduction process with the elimination of half of the oxygen. So, if we consider so that particular step can also be very nicely detected in this particular plot and O2 elimination from CuO if it is formed as a very transient species because we are unable to detect the formation of CuO as the end product of heating of copper sulphate pentahydrate. So, it is your Cu2 which is your real end product what we get from this particular heating process. So, this real end product. So, this real end product is going for so the conversion that means this conversion from cupric oxide to cuprous oxide is basically a reduction process. So, at high temperature we go for this typical reduction. So, no reducing agent is required it is only the elimination of O2 gas O2 itself is going out from your sample giving rise to your CO2O because this particular CO2 is also a very good and useful species it can be a catalyst also. So, from copper sulphate pentahydrate we know all the different steps and we can also some good idea how this particular one that means how this particular one that means the monohydrate has some stability and this monohydrate can be prepared also and this monohydrate this water binding is completely different with the involvement of the sulphate. So, that is why we get this particular one that means this water molecule is completely different from that of the four other copper which is present and which is going away from this. So, what we can consider that we know that the copper has a typical coordination number of 4. So, if 4 of them are of same type we put 4 water molecules around this copper which are of one type. So, we put this as a one type water molecule over there. Then we have to put or we put it also that another water molecule and the sulphate anion and which are also entangled with that sulphate that means some close association of this water molecule with that of your sulphate will give rise to some extra stability to this particular water which is lost in the third step. So, this gives us a very good idea about the corresponding thermogavimetric analysis for identification as well as the characterization of a sample which is well known to us. So, any other sample such as your food material can also be very nicely analyzed this by this particular technique. So, the decomposition of your sucrose sample. So, the decomposition of your sucrose sample at 10 Kelvin per minute in air will give rise to a plot like this. So, your TGA plot will see all say that it is basically stable till uh, 220 degree or degree centigrade where we have. So, the sucrose can be dried enough for this particular one case. So, and beyond that we have a continuous uh, mass loss for a typical weight loss of these things that we can have a corresponding residue after this complete burning. 
So, you have this that means, this particular part we can separate out with these two horizontal line we can extend. So, this is one horizontal line. So, but you have the basically this sort of inflection point actual plot is like that, but we can break into this as the horizontal line and this steps basically. So, we can pinpoint this temperature we can pinpoint this temperature also for this particular inflection point what is your 500 4 degree centigrade at this particular point above 500 degree centigrade. So, this particular step which is basically a 63 percent weight loss starting from 233 degree centigrade. So, this is a typical loss of your sucrose burning process, but what sort of this burning whether it is a exothermic or endothermic just now we have seen in some other example that when we have the plot which is in the upward direction the derivative plot we call it as the exothermic heat is being released energy is being released. But if we consider that corresponding derivative plot of this so this particular plot uh, change of this is typically the corresponding thing that means your endothermic melting process or we sometimes call it as a typically the food engineers basically say that the food chemistry for that which is caramelization. So, this caramelization process is basically taking place due to the melting process when sucrose has the melting uh, the melt condition. So, the melt the sucrose melt basically give us the corresponding caramel what we use for uh, making cake making uh, pastry and all these things. So, which are very useful uh, process at which stage the exothermic decomposition and combustion also occurs. So, after that also, so this is your endothermic peak and when we try to detect this particular one that means, at around 500 degree centigrade. So, followed by an uh, endothermic caramelization peak at which stage the exothermic decomposition or combustion occurs. So, what we get again from that same book we get this plot that means, your sucrose can be characterized in terms of its endothermic or exothermic peaks are depending upon its corresponding melting process. So, what we see now that if we have another material that means, maize and corn starch so is a mixture. So, not only the pure sample the sample quality the sample purity also can be checked if we find that this temperature for this mass loss what we know that the corresponding determination of melting point is also a very good technique for identifying the purity of the sample. Similarly, the boiling point also is a very good technique to determine the corresponding purity of the sample in such a way that we now see that the TGA plot the TGA curve of a mixture of maize and corn starch and crystalline sugar. So, you have the starch and the sugar. So, if we have the mel, uh, the corresponding mixture of these that means, you have this as we have seen that above 200 we have the caramelization step for sugar. Initially, we have the loss of moisture from starch. So, starch has huge amount of moisture. So, when the mixture is being heated basically all these three all are the corresponding component of the food material. So, the corresponding TGA plot the characteristic TGA plot is also tells us that what sort of thing is happening and what sort of mixture we have. So, first is the moisture loss then the caramelization process then this particular step what has been also deconvoluted in terms of some straight line slopes of these. So, one straight line then the second one is a very direct one which is a perpendicular one and then some slope corresponding to the baseline thin. So, baseline has been drawn over here. So, which is the basic main decomposition step of corn starch and which is also about 25 percent of that decomposition starting from your 309 degree centigrade is the midpoint. Um, inflection point as well as the corresponding midpoint is here. So, midpoint temperature for your decomposition of starch. So, not only the burning of the carbon particles or the carbon paste or any other carbon powder, but we can also analyze the corresponding uh, food samples very nice food samples sometimes the powder samples of all these can be analyzed. And since we are processing for this thing making cake making biscuits. 
uh, making uh, pastries and all these things we require to have some temperature that means oven temperature. We set some oven temperature and most of these things around 200 or 300 degrees centigrade, but if we go beyond that what sort of other thing can happen uh, during the corresponding making of the cookies, the homemade cookies or the biscuits that we can find out from your TGA plot of the food samples. So, the quantitative analysis now if we can go that the typical quantitative analysis if we see that the derivative plot will then be useful. So, the derivative plot whether it is a exothermic plot or endothermic plot what we see that for this typical one. So, if you have that from 0 and is the when it is derivative plot that means is the milligram per minute that means if we go for in the time axis this is your now time axis. So, if your derivative plot the instrument directly records the thing. So, the DTG plot is like this. So, from 0, 0.0 in the negative direction that means the mass loss is taking place for this particular process and if we go for its corresponding integration using the baseline of this particular point. So, if we have the first step then you have the second step around 300 degree centigrade. So, this is the temperature above this axis is the temperature axis and then the time axis. So, it is almost the monotonous increase that means, whether you go for the time axis or you the temperature axis. So, around 300 you have this particular peak and this peak is being shaded and how you draw the baseline because originally you have this 0 baseline and this 0 baseline was like that when we have started our process that means, when we start our recording the thing from 0 degree centigrade. So, we go for this, but this particular plot that means, this particular crest uh, uh, the top this one that means, the depression is in this particular point of say uh, temperature we see that when it is going up it is not reaching to your original 0 line. That means, sometimes it is not so easy to get that your plot is touching the baseline before the start of the plot and at the end also it is going down again to the same one. It is not happening to any kind of plot what is happening over there in the real sense is that when we go for this thing because when we reach this when we try to go back to your baseline what is happening that your this temperature is nearby this temperature is close by. So, this temperature will be reaching. So, your recording for the second peak is also commencing. So, the commencement of the second peak immediately after the first one will not allow the baseline to touch the 0 line it will be like this. So, when after this also again a very sharp line it is reaching over here, but at this point also it will not again go and go back to your 0 line because you have a third point. So, if you have the third point, so this will go. So, when you go for the baseline uh, type spline we get, so is it not this particular exact baseline, but instead of that we smoothen the plot that is as if this plot is not there. So, if we smoothen the plot and we see the line, so this if we make this as a hand drawn also and sometimes the computer software can take care of this thing to draw it in this particular form. So, if we go like this and this particular plot is basically this and then the shaded, shaded area the shaded area is because of this corresponding area due to the particular thermal process. So, instead of using the step evaluation of TGA curve because we know that the TGA curve can have the different steps a mass loss can be quantified because we are looking for the quantification that means the actual amount of mass loss what is being uh, taking place from your derivative plot by integrating the DTG peak that corresponds to the TGA step. So, your TGA step was there. So, you have the original TGA step and corresponding to that TGA step we have the corresponding derivative one 
and the area under this derivative plot is then quantified for this uh, corresponding mass loss and which we try to correlate with your T g plot. So, your data you have in your hand and this data you can also quantify in terms of its corresponding area determination. So, this area determination will also tell us in such a way that if we go for this for this derivative plot. So, this derivative plot will give us some information uh, in this regard that how you get this derivative plot and how we can correlate this with that of your thermogabimetric plot. So, the next case we will just go for your corresponding another technique is your not a differential thermogabimetric analysis, but a derivative one is also not is a differential thermal analysis is a another type of analysis where we will concern or we will focus our attention on the temperature change. So, if we can monitor the corresponding temperature change of the sample as well as the reference, we can have some plot for that. And as a result what we are just basically looking for this temperature change is the corresponding heat effects, because we are heating the sample as well as the reference within the same furnace. So, we will now try to monitor the corresponding heat effects and how the heat effects that means, how much heat we give to the sample or the reference is responsible for the corresponding change in the temperature. So, what we find here for the differential thermal analysis, it involves a heating or cooling test of the sample and the inert reference material both of them we place inside the furnace, because both of them are nearby within a difference of say 1 centimeter only. So, they will remain in identical conditions and while recording any temperature difference between the sample and the reference we will try to monitor. Then this differential temperature is there now this temperature we call as the different this differential temperature when we keep sample as the reference in the furnace which is different from your differential T g plot. So, this differential in temperature is then plotted against the time or against the temperature because in D t g plot we are talking in terms of the corresponding mass loss, but here we will be talking in terms of the corresponding difference in temperature between the sample and the reference. So, now if there is any change in the sample which led to the absorption or evolution of heat between these two that means, the sample and the reference. So, if you have the changes there, then the heat can be that the corresponding absorption whether you have exothermic process or an endothermic process can be detected relative to an inert reference that you have the inert reference and that reference sample is also being heated. You have the simple reference material, it can be your like that of your crucible material like alumina, it can be your alpha alumina also and that alumina is also heated. So, how the temperature rise can take place for alumina sample as well as your sample under test. So, we get these two things that means, the heat effects what we find these basic heat effects uh, and these heat effects are basically associated with several chemical and physical changes. So, there are changes which can be chemical or physical and we have to plot as a function of temperature and time or temperature or time okay, not and is or time. So, function of temperature or time we plot this and these temperatures are there. So, what we try to find is that the heat effects. So, what we basically look for any reaction we now have some idea about the delta H values because we know that if we, there is equilibrium we always in talk in terms of the corresponding free energy change of the reaction. That means, the delta G value now we will talk in terms of the corresponding delta H value and this delta H value can be both way that means, it can be exothermic 
or it can be endothermic. So basically what we now look for that the heat effects are there, sample is taking heat for a particular type of process that means it can be your crystallization, it can be your decomposition, it can be your oxidation or it can be your reduction. But what sort of this heat effect we can see for these processes? So any change of these samples can either be exothermic or endothermic can be detected relative to an inert reference material. So, what we see that these DTA curves can provide data on the transformation, several transformations, these transformations can be exothermic transformations or endothermic transformations and such as you have the glass transitions, you can have the crystallization, you can have the melting, you can have the sublimation. So, all these processes can be monitored by DTA that means different the corresponding thermal analysis, differential thermal analysis and like that of your DTG plot, the DTA also can give rise to some area under the plot that means is also a peak type of thing. We can monitor the corresponding enthalpy change and not affected by the heat capacity of the sample. The sample heat capacity will be ignoring that, we will not consider the corresponding sample heat capacity, but we are looking for these particular processes and we basically monitor these in terms of the corresponding differential method and sample temperature now what temperature change? It is the temperature change of the sample will be continuously compared with some reference material or the reference material sample as the corresponding reference temperature. So, the reference temperature is being monitored with that of our reference. Uh, temperature with that of our sample temperature if we heat both of them together inside the furnace. Okay. Thank you very much. So, next day we will continue again from here.